Okay, so, uh, all right, so thank you very much for inviting me to talk to Sean. It's very nice being back in Mysore. Um, so, um, my name, as you know, is, is Raghavendra Rao, but most people, it's too form, formal for most people, so most of people call me Raghu, right? I mean, it's such a complicated name outside India, especially in the South, it's not a problem at all. But outside India, it's such a problem that even Google gets us wrong. Right? So this is my Google voicemail message, which was left me when I was in America. It said, this is Robert Green, and calling from the National Market Research Firm. We would like to speak with the Avenger. <laughs> right? So obviously, the Avenger sounds a lot more like me than Robert Green. Right? So if you guys watch the Marvel movies, you know what to call them. And of course, Raghu is nice because there are, you know, there are lots of different types of Raghu around the world. So, and not just that, but uh, I also have a number of lookalikes around the world. For example, this guy I've been mistaken for a couple of times. So it really has happened. I had a, a person come up to me and say, are you Ben, Ben Renangi? And said, well, you know, if you're a banker, I can be Ben for you. <laughs> he wasn't a banker, so anyway. Another person, for those of you who watch a lot of soccer, is this guy over here. So he is the, he is the uh, manager of Manchester City football team. So if you watch that, that's me actually. So, you know. Now <laughs> um, this guy over here, the more so than that. Right, so my background is actually all in India. So I started with an undergraduate degree in chemistry at VU. But I figured out that um, very fast after my degree that some major thing wrong with chemistry was there's no money in chemistry, right? So. Basically, if I wanted a job, I had to do something else. So I did an MBA from I'm Bangalore, and then eventually did a PhD in finance at NCI. So I worked for a couple of years in India. I worked in India uh, with Indian oil. But then most recently, as you pointed out, I was at Barclays Global Investors, where my job was in charge of the Asian equity group. So I was looking at countries like China, like Pakistan, India, uh, Vietnam, places like that, trying to find stocks that are undervalued. If you find these stocks that are undervalued, you can buy them cheap and then make a lot of money, hopefully when the stocks go up, right? So um, that's typically what a hedge fund manager does. And Barclays Global Investors was the largest hedge fund in the world at that time. It had managed about $2 trillion worth of assets. So $2,000 billion worth of assets. And typically what we do is we look for events. We look for an event that changes the stock price completely. The event hits the stock price is affected immediately. So let's take an example of this. This is the entire stock market from 2008, 2010. And what's interesting about it, of course, is uh, that was the day I joined BGI. The moment I joined BGI, the entire market collapsed. <laughs> now you would say, wait, this is a coincidence because you know this was the same week Lehman went bankrupt, financial crisis happened, and I would say, yes, I'm with you. Is this a coincidence? Except. And that was the day I decided to become a professor again. <laughs> so, and I showed this graph to some friends of mine in Cambridge, and they looked at the graph and then they said, wait a minute, when you came to Cambridge in 2011, that's when all the European problems happened, right? So Greece had a big problem, Brexit happened, all of that happened after you came here. And I've come here to my sir, and boom, the RBI governor resigned a few years. You always have to be very careful about that. <laughs> anyway. So I, as pointed out, I was also uh, one of the eight Nobel Prize in Management. And basically this is a prize um, which you guys know what the egg is, right? Mm -hmm. So the eight Nobel Prize is the opposite of the Nobel Prize. Right? So if you've heard of the Nobel Prize, think of the exact opposite. It's a prize given to people whose research makes you laugh and then makes you think, wait, why is this person, oh, maybe there is something in that kind of research. For example, it turns out that the University of Cambridge has the highest number of Nobel laureates in the whole world. It has 102 Nobel laureates. Pretty much, almost every year we win a Nobel Prize. It has only two egg Nobel Prize winners, me and another professor in the mathematics department. He got his Nobel, egg Nobel Prize for modeling the forces which form a human ponytail. So if you, if you draw your hair back in a ponytail, it turns out there's a precise mathematical formula you can use to model that. And there is a length of hair, which you call the Rapunzel length. If your hair is shorter than the Rapunzel length, it will frizz up when you add shampoo. If it doesn't, if it's longer than the Rapunzel length, your hair will remain straight. Procter & Gamble use that for a great deal of their uh, selling for shelling shampoo. So very useful discovery. But when you first hear the discovery, you say, why is somebody 
doing a piece of research into the length of it, you know, into what is the force for a human ponytail, right? Another guy from Andrew Guy, and he got it, he was the only guy who got both the Ig Nobel Prize and the Nobel Prize. He got the Ig Nobel Prize for levitating a frog. Basically, he took a frog, used magnets to levitate it, but the magnets he used were made of graphene, so the invention of graphene got him the Nobel Prize. So you can have, basically, it's kind of fun prize to win. Anyway, that was me getting the prize. More interesting is uh, the innovation which actually happens. So the innovation that happens, this is held in Harvard University every year. So it's going to be held, I believe, in every August, end of every August, if the year. And they have, they're not that wealthy, the organization giving it, and I'll tell you why. Uh, anyway, but the point is to light up a big room like this costs a lot of money. So what they do is to have a human spotlight. She follows you around the stage with a flashlight held above your head. So, you know, if you want to give a basically, um, it costs fifteen dollars an hour, so much cheaper than having permanent spotlights, paying and paying for those spotlights all the time. But the most difficult part, which is something which I really give them credit for, is the innovative way in which to get professors to stop talking. The major problem, as you know, with professors is they like talking. Right? You, so when Shalini said, you know, you want to give a talk, I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? Right? It's pretty much. I wasn't really. Oh my God, it's going to be you because know, you know. Um, your families don't listen to you, nobody else listens to you. Here you have people coming in from around the city to listen to you. Why don't you like talking, right? So that's the whole point. The definition of a professor is somebody who talks in other people's sleep. <laughs> so anyway, so the question here is how do you shut up this person after his acceptance speech, his or her acceptance speech, which can be no longer than one minute. So that's really difficult. How do you shut up this professor? So what they've done is to call a little girl, her name is Miss Sweetie Pooh. So she would come up, exactly after your speech is done, to stand, look you in the face and say, please stop, you're so boring. <laughs> and she keeps saying this until you stop talking. Right? So, one of the stories, of course, at any point in the course when I'm talking, if you feel kind of bored, you know what to say. <laughs> okay, the good news about the award is the prize, the first prize is $100 trillion. You guys have seen that amount of money, right? Well, here it is. If you haven't seen it, this is actually Zimbabwe dollars, unfortunately. <laughs> so it's about five dollars in U.S. currency. So I have that frame behind my desk. So I thought I'd be independently wealthy, but unfortunately not. Okay. So what am I going to be talking about today? Uh, basically, the, the course which I'm teaching here at Mara is all about coordination. So what I'm talking about is our brains can't handle it. Okay, so that means that we are, that other problem is also bad. So the first problem was, we are dealing, remember, with three problems. Imperfect information, asymmetric information, and behavior biases. So, so imperfect information says, I don't have enough information, so that means I'm giving you more information. But that creates behavior biases, as we just saw. So to solve the behavioral biases, I might say, let me give you a summary number. A number which will condense all the preferences you have, that's easy to deal with, right? So it solves the behavior biases. Unfortunately, it creates even new behavior biases. For example, the price is ending in knives. Right? We all know that people price this stuff all the time. 9,999 rupees for something, right? Or just, you know, 199. We see this on the newspaper all the time. The story, of course, is that we get fooled by the idea that it's like, you know, 99 looks much less than 100, so there's a psychological price point in our head. And so, uh, you know, I don't know if that's true or not, but marketers do tell you the story all the time. But one of my favorite stories was actually with Steve Jobs when he was coming up and pricing the first iPad. Now, what is the problem with the iPad? No one had ever seen an iPad before, right? It was a brand new product which you had never seen. So how do you price an iPad? It's this, it's this piece of, you know, metal or thing which is like a big phone but it's too big to fit in your pocket and what do you use it for? Nobody had ever seen a product like this. So how do you price it? And what Steve Jobs did was an amazing piece of theater. So he basically stood out on the stage like this and he said, okay, this is our new product which we have out there and he showed the iPad 
And he said, this is what you can do. You can check your email, blah, 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 but you can do all that with your phone. So he wasn't really saying anything except for the size of my finger. And then he said, but this is such an amazing thing that I'm actually going to we ask all our engineers, how much should we charge for this? And the engineer said, well, depending on the cost of all the components and everything else like that, you know, it should be not less than $999. And, and if we asked an analyst, the analyst said $999 as well. And he said, of course, that really means $1,000, you know, because people will think $999 is less than $1,000. And of course, everybody in the audience laughs because they kind of figure out, oh yeah, yeah, $999, uh, yeah, we, we, we are too smart to be fooled by that. And then Steve Jobs goes on to say, well, but we are not, I, I want this iPad to be accessible to everybody, not just a few people. So we're not going to price it at $9.99. We're not even going to price it at $7.99. We're going to price it at $499. So he put that big number up there, $499 in big letters, the $9.99 disappears from the screen, $499 is replaced it, and everybody doesn't, nobody realizes They've been suckered by this anchoring effect, which is a second behavioral bias which you are depending on. Right? The point is, you don't know how to price it. So the first number I give you, the 999, is that thing sitting in your head saying, whoa, that's a price I should be fixated on. But it actually comes in at 499, that's a bargain. Whoa, this is, this is amazing, it is selling at half price. Why should we not buy two iPads? It costs the same as what we would think it would cost. That's the idea there. Or pick this restaurant in New York. It's now home to $175 hamburger. Who would pay $175 for a hamburger? Well, maybe a few Wall Street guys who just got their bonuses, but most of us would never pay $175 for a hamburger. So what's the point of having a $175 hamburger? It makes everything else look very reasonable. So when you go in and look at the menu and you see a $175 hamburger, then you go down and see an $80 steak. You're like, whoa, that's so cheap. Let's buy the steak. So again, this is when we focus on one number, condensing number, the price, you're basically getting fooled by another set of behavioral bias. Same thing happens when you buy wine at a restaurant, for example. The biggest markups are always on the second most expensive bottle of wine. Because nobody buys the most expensive bottle of wine. It's too expensive. But they don't want to look cheap, so they buy the second most expensive bottle. So the biggest profit margins are always on the second most expensive bottle of wine. The most expensive bottle of wine is usually a bargain. You should go for that. All right, in China, the numbers four and eight are very good. So uh, number four sounds like death. So you would never buy anything with a number four in it. But eight sounds like good luck. So when companies go public in China, they go public at eight yuan 88 uh, cents. So that's 8.88, that's the price at which you go public. Nobody would go public at 4.44 because the number four sounds like death. The number eight sounds like good fortune. But of course, one 8.88 share is two shares at 4.44. So really, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But it's all about behavior biases and our propensity to be fooled by numbers. All right, so what do we need today? So basically, remember, we're trying to solve the first imperfect information problem. So what we need, first of all, is a way to describe what we need. Even before we need something, we need to figure out what is it that we're looking for. So we need a language. We need a language to describe everything we need to, we actually want to buy. Second thing, we need to match our preferences along different dimensions so we select the optimal transaction partner. And third, we need a way to capture all our preferences. Okay, so let's look at the first one. The first one, the language is called ontology. And the word ontology is actually just means the language. Right? Okay. So let's take an example. When you buy a pair of shoes from a website like Zappos, this is what it looks like. Right? So if you have a website, literally hundreds of possible things you can sort on. Right? So this is just men's sneakers, but you can sort on size, brand, type of sneaker, type, price type, color, you name it, you can sort it. You have literally hundreds of different options when you're trying to figure out just one thing, a pair of shoes. So the question is, how can an online retailer provide you with that much information about their shoes? It like, looks like a ton of things you have to make up your mind on. So what they do is match with every product they have. They have an enormous amount of data sitting in the back, 
which is characterizing that piece of information along a million other dimensions. Now, this is OK if it's a standardized thing. Right? And the data is also data. This categories are also data. But there's a data about the type of data you have. So it's data describing the data you have, the metadata. And this is becoming an important, a very, very important part of anything doing anything today. Without labeling, you cannot find anything online. So in the old days, this was easy because the data was in relational databases. You have the same labels, you have the same um, you know, headings, um, you have the same stuff which goes inside them. That's all easy. Today, unfortunately, that's not possible. Right? Because you have a whole bunch of different things. You have email, web pages, images, audio, video. They all have to fit in there. So when you do something like YouTube, when you try to find something on YouTube, you'll be impressed by just how amazingly obscure. You can type in pretty much anything you want, you'll find something on YouTube which looks at that. So how does YouTube do this? How does YouTube allow you to find a concept rather than an item? Finding a pair of shoes is OK. But how about uh, doing a somersault? If you want to do a somersault, you'll find, type in how to do a somersault on YouTube, you'll find someone doing it. That means YouTube has to understand the concept of a somersault. It can't be keywords because everyone is using their own keywords. So the keywords are basically different for different people. If you don't call it a somersault, will YouTube bring it up? The answer in many cases will be yes. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. But there are two types of situations. Situation number one is a specialized platform. So for example, washing machines, TVs, hard disks, hard drives, things like that, right? This is relatively easy to do. Why? Because it's already labeled by the manufacturer. So the manufacturer has already told you what's the type of TV it is, 4K, <coughs> uh, curved screen, flat screen, all of that stuff is there. That's rel rel relatively easy to do. However, the problem is in a general marketplace, right? So let's contrast eBay versus Amazon. If you look at eBay, do we anyone should try finding things on eBay? If you try finding things on eBay, you literally have to wait through hundreds and hundreds of pages in order to find what you're looking for. Right? So that means, in other words, the discoverability of things on eBay is about 42%. 58% of the time, you will not find what you're looking for on eBay. So what's going on? Why? Think of a difference. Amazon, in contrast, you can find pretty much anything you want to look for. You can find any book you want. But why did Amazon start with books? Yeah, the guys, some of the you already in my class know the answer. So it's because there already was a decimal classification system for books, right? The Dewey Decimal Classification System. So I'm very glad you guys are paying attention. <laughs> so um, basically, they just take that classification system and apply it straight to books. And then they could adapt it to anything else you want to buy. So now when you look at Amazon, it's very well described because you start from a very easily defined set of objects and then go on from anywhere else. eBay is facing a giant problem now because it didn't start that way. It went the other way. Anyone could try to find anything, but now there are millions of possible things you can find, so no one can find anything. So that's called data ontology, and it's a really hot field for careers today. It turns out eBay is trying to improve its discoverability to about 90%. That's that goal. And they have bought a whole bunch of companies like Alation, Corrigan, Expert Maker, and their job is to do things like basically looking for concepts and trying to use natural language processing or AI to transform them into categories that people can search for. Right? So that's the big, that's one of the big things which is going on. So that's the first step. The first step is classifying your data you have. You have a ton of data, completely unstructured. How do you classify it so people can actually go through that data to get to where you want it to be? What I'm trying to develop with this idea is that first concept we were doing, which is automation. Right? It said we're going to do three concepts, automation, AI, and blockchain. So automation involves basically replacing human beings with computers, we're using with some kind of automated technology. And one of the things it is, is replacing people in a shop. So when you go into a shop, you ask the shopkeeper for something, the shopkeeper will find it for you. Here, you don't have a shopkeeper. You have a computer which is somehow filtering through millions of possible items to give you what you want. So you're trying to get to a place where 
at the end of the day, you don't need a human being. You don't need anything to classify but, uh, what you want. So that's the ultimate first goal. Classify all the data you have. The second goal is match the person with what you want. So if I want something, I should be able to find that something and give it to this person. So this becomes difficult once you have more and more preference choices. So if you have one dimension, it's very easy. But once you have 10 dimensions, it becomes really, really difficult. Think about getting airline flights or a place to stay. There's so many different things you can look for. Yes, you can look for price, but also time in the morning. Right? Uh, what, is, what is the airline? Should you fly jet air? Right, right now, it may not be a good idea. Should you fly um, at 4 in the morning? If the price is 100 rupees cheaper than flying at 4.30, is a half an hour sleep worth 100 rupees to you? These are the questions we're debating all the time. So that's the problem here. It's information overload. If you try hunting for any of these things, you literally come up with millions of options because the data has already been classified in the back by Zappos and all these other guys. So they're giving you all those millions of options, and now you have to choose from those millions of options. This is really, really difficult. It makes our life very, very hard. So the, now we are coming, the big next step is to come up with an algorithm that aggregates multi-dimensional preferences and gives me a best choice possible. Well, I don't need to do this. For example, coming in here, Hitmonk has something called the agony column. So you can, you can sort your airline by price, you can sort it by uh, time of day, departure, and everything, or you can sort it by the amount of agony you're facing on the flight. So agony sort of combines all these different things, the seat width, the seat pitch, um, the time of day, the number of stopovers that you have to take, all of that together, and tells you this flight is probably the least agonizing among all these things. But that's just the first step, because it doesn't know how much you value each of those different things is giving you one number. It's hopefully a way that you can say, I really want to be able to sleep well, so I'm willing to pay much more if I get a flight that leaves at 8 o'clock in the morning so I have enough time to get to the airport after a good night's sleep. Uh, something to match it to my preferences, not to a general preference which everybody might have. Okay, so that's what we're doing. We're basically looking at patterns in the data, except the data here is our preference streams. So the preference stream itself is a separate stream which adds on to the top of the price. So it says not just the price I'm willing to pay, but all the raw data about I prefer, um, you know, high booted, uh, high boots to uh, low boots. I prefer thicker soles to thinner soles. All of that is added in addition to that one there in order to give me the final choice I want. And a bunch of papers which talk about how to do this when you have multiple contracts with your dimensions. So, that, and this is used in a lot, for example, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon product recommendations, all of these are examples where they're trying to find out what to recommend what you might like. And that's their business model, right? So when you, when you buy something on Amazon, Amazon always says, well, people who have bought this also typically buy this, right? Or if you, you, these are products you might be interested in based on all your past history. This is true, it's based on your past history, but it's also based on everybody else's past history. So that means it's not just you who's buying stuff, but every time anybody anywhere in the world buys from Amazon, Amazon has that data to say, well, now let's look at it on an aggregated basis. The easiest way to see this is with Netflix. Now, Netflix had a huge problem in about, this one of the earliest examples of multidimensional preference matching. They had a huge problem in the 1980s. Now what that problem was, was, so Netflix wanted people to sign up for their movies. Right? So basically you pay a constant sum every month and they will stream videos to you. So how do they do that? You can't just say, here we have 10,000 movies on our website because if you ever actually try to navigate the Netflix website, it's a pain in the butt. Right? So trying to find a movie on Netflix is crazy. However, what Netflix does is every time you watch a movie, it suggests, it says, did you like this movie? You rate that movie. And it says, if you like that movie, here's another movie you might like. And so we watch it. If we like it, we trust Netflix a little more. And we keep doing this as it goes along. 
Now the question is, how does Netflix predict what you're going to like? It's based again on your past history, but it's also based on everybody else's past history. So remember, this is one of the early. The problem they were doing, the problem they were facing, is that they couldn't get past 60%. That means there's only 60% chance they could predict what movie you're going to like. And 60% is really bad because it's slightly better than a toss of a coin. Like 50% is a toss of a coin. So 60%, not much better than 50%. Okay, so the, what they did was to have a competition. They launched what they call the Netflix Prize. So a million dollars, they would give you all the data they had on all their customers. And then they would strip the names, they take off the names and take off the identifying information. But they had everything else, your gender, your age, everything. And then they would say, okay, based on that information, can you predict what this person will like based on what you already have? And people did it like crazy, so the big thing, lots of people went in there, the Netflix prize, right? So, binge watching forever. It, it, was, it, it was a huge success. Basically, quarters from around the world were trying to win that prize. And they got from 60% to 80%. But that stopped right there. And so, the problem actually, was one movie, a movie called Napoleon Dynamite. Have any of you seen that movie here? Yeah, so one, one person has. How did you like the movie? Didn't like it? It was okay. Okay, the problem is, Napoleon Dynamite is one of those weird movies which is impossible to predict what you like. So people who like action movies, you like Die Hard, you say yes, I like Napoleon Dynamite. You like romantic comedies when Harry met Sally, you like Napoleon Dynamite. So Napoleon Dynamite, you throw it in the mixture there, you basically screwed up the entire rating. You take Napoleon Dynamite out, the rating jumps to 90%. The accuracy of the product rating jumps to 90%. That was a huge problem. Right? There were two or three movies. One was just Napoleon Dynamite. Another movie was uh, Miss Congeniality with Sandra Bullock, Sandra Bullock. So that was another movie. Very difficult to predict who would like that movie and who would hate that movie. Do a few movies like that. Anyway, so that was a case of the Napoleon Dynamite problem. All right, so what we have now is first step where the, the businesses have a way of categorizing all that data. They have a way of putting it into categories so that we can choose among that category. Second one, they, we've got a way of aggregating all our preferences so that we don't have to make a choice based only on price. The third thing is, someone then has to combine it all together and say, this is your best choice. So you don't have to get up and you know, wait, make a decision. You basically pick up the phone, press a button, and say, hey, get me a flight from here to Delhi. The computer will automatically hunt through everything. It knows your preferences. It knows what time you like to get up in the morning. It knows what the traffic conditions are likely to be like. It minimizes every piece of agony for you and gets you the best possible one. Basically, at the end of the day, you need a, a computerized 24 by 7 digital assistant. Right? The assistant will act exactly like a personal secretary who will do whatever wants, uh, whatever the old days a human being would do for you. Okay? That's the ideal goal. So that's step number three. That means step number step number two, remember, was you manage to figure out all our different preferences. Step number three is the computer needs to put them all together and suggest something to you. The computer needs to understand you. Okay? So let's look at that third level now. What do we need? First thing we need is huge volumes of data. Right? So machine learning systems need this to train themselves to, uh, to figure out what's, what are the patterns hidden inside that data. So for example, Google basically took all the text they found everywhere in the world to find the probability pattern the word usage for the language translation tool. So every time you use Google Translate to and use that language which Google has suggested, Google automatically says, okay, I can use that information to make it a little better for the next time. So it's all feedback coming every time you use the language translation tool. Right. And second, that feedback is there, right? So the feedback, because it's automatically there, another example would be when you're using Gmail. When you use Gmail and you type your emails nowadays, have you noticed that Google automatically completes your sentences for you? Right? So. How many of you trust read that sentence is not quite what we want, but we're like, yeah, close enough. So you just take it anyway. Right, have we done that? 
and a lot of us do this all the time, right? In effect, there are two things going on. One is, of course, the computer is making our life easier by completing our sentences, but the second thing it does is make us everybody speak in exactly the same way, the Google way. Right? So we're not actually using our own words, we're using the word that Google suggests we should use given on the basis of what everybody in the whole world is using. Maybe this is a good thing, maybe this is not a good thing. We'll come back to that. But anyway, we're looking for exactly that. Right? So can computers understand human beings? The problem is most of these things are based on psychometrics. Psychometrics is a relatively new field which basically consists of understanding your preferences to model you as a human being. That means I can predict what you're going to do based on what information you reveal about yourself. Let's take some examples. So if I ask you a question like, which celebrity do you prefer, Tom Cruise or Frank Sinatra? Okay, some of you is Tom Cruise, some of you Frank Sinatra, not a problem. Okay, so which of these word clouds do you find more is, is more you. This one is all about things like weekend, home, shopping, birthday, you know, happy, that kind of stuff. This one is all about universe, music, writing, soul. Which is more you? So that, the point is that psychometrics basically gives you these kind of texts. They ask you for answers to these questions and then they classify you on a scale which is if you like Tom Cruise and you like Weekend home happy, you're a kind of more conservative and traditional person. If you like Frank Sinatra and you like the universe music dream thing, then you're a little more of a liberal and artistic person. And basically, you have five different dimensions on which you can classify human beings. That's a Myers Briggs um, psychology test. So, this is actually a colleague of mine, David Stilwell, who started the Cambridge <laughs> Center for Psychometrics in Cambridge who did the first test which did this on Facebook. So what he did was basically started a, post a, a Facebook quiz where you will automatically email uh, this whole you know, list of uh, questions. If you answered it, he would use it, would give you a psychometric test, would give you a result based on Myers-Briggs or one of the other personality tests. So this is a scientifically validated psychology test. But then he did, okay, it turns out that he collected all the data through opt-in, so you had to choose to participate on that. Feedback was the only incentive, that means I'd tell you what type of person you are. And a lot of people really wanted to do that. So they really gave them a lot of data. They had over a million people who signed up within a period of a month for this information. The clever thing he did then was to actually go back and ask Facebook for permission to look at the profile pages of those people who are actually participating in the quiz. So now, you've identified yourself according to your personality. You, I know that you're outgoing, I know that you are conservative or whatever. And you're taking the test to make to understand yourself. So you're likely to be very honest about what you actually are, right? So I know you're conservative. Then I say, okay, what kind of comments do you post on the Facebook page? What do you like? What do you not like? What kind of images do you give thumbs up to? Right? So it turns out, if you do it that way, if you're extroverts, are people who like these kind of things. Right? They like party, baby, right? And they like elongating the vowel. I missed you guys so much. You know, that kind of thing. That's very really extroverted people. These are the kind of comments that post on their Facebook page. Introverts, on the other hand, or something like this. Computers, Pokemon, manga, anime, right? They have elongated vowels too, but it's always negative. No, for example, things like that. No very positive people. Okay, so basically I've got your personality and I can tell you exactly what words you're using from your personality types. So what he went on further and he basically said, okay, let's look at the number of Facebook likes you actually have in your page. If you have about 10 Facebook likes, the computer can predict you as well as a work colleague. And a work colleague typically can predict about 27% accuracy what type of person you are. That means a work colleague doesn't really know you very really well. 27% chance of being able to say what kind of person you are. Your friend has about a 45% chance. The average accuracy of human beings is about 49%. Your family is 50. The computer's average accuracy is 56%. That means Facebook knows you better than your own mother. 
your only person who might know you better than your uh, than the computer is probably your spouse, but the accuracy difference is very very small. Right. So all this is saying, yes, the computer knows a lot about what you actually are already. Now, are human beings predictable? Are companies actually using this to, you know, to predict what you're going to do? The example I'm going to use is a company called Tala. Tala is a company which involves giving loans to people in countries like Kenya, in countries like Zambia, where there are no credit histories, where there are no registers of credit. There's no, there's no way to actually tell that this, you know, has actually. Uh, predict whether this person will pay you back the money or not. So Thala uses tries to figure out will this person pay back the money in a country like that. It's like you know villages in India. Right? Can you actually predict whether a particular villager will pay back the money? So the way it works, and uh, Shivani Suraya is the founder. She has a very nice uh, uh, TED talk on YouTube, which you might want to take a look at. But anyway, in the TED talk, she describes a typical example. So in this example, what happened was the World Cup was on, and there was this guy in, uh, in I think it was in Kenya, who had the only TV in his village. So what would happen is everybody would come to his house to watch TV. Of course, you know, you're not going to watch it for free, so they all pay him to watch TV in his house. Okay, fair enough. Except, right when the first goal is scored, the electricity goes off. Why? Because the guy hasn't paid his electricity bills. So what he then did is go on his phone, sorry, go on his phone and yeah. So what he did was to pull out his phone and apply for a loan from Tala. Tala gives him the loan in three seconds. He uses that money to pay the electricity bill. The electricity is turned on. They continue watching the game. At the end of the game, he finished. They, they all pay him the money. They transfer the money over phones to him. And then he uses that money to pay back Tala for the loan. So the entire loan, it's approved in three seconds. It lasts less than 90 minutes, the length of the game. And you know, it's terminated at the end. The question is, how on earth do you actually make a loan that fast? No bank in the world would be able to do something like that, right? You, when you apply for a loan from a bank, it takes you a long amount of time. You have to go in there, fill in a bunch of papers. It's a pain. But this was all done in the space of three seconds. What, what kind of information would Tala be figuring out to figure out whether you're going to pay back the money or not? Ideas? Sorry? I'm sorry. How he is making money. How he's making money. True. One possibility. But then remember, how do you figure out how he's making money? He just applied for the loan on the phone, right? He hasn't actually told you. And if he can tell you how he's making money, he could be lying. Right? So there's no verification possible because you have no verification in a country like Zambia or Kenya. What else could it be? So what is the information he's getting? The, the company or? Sorry? The, the company is getting information on the bills that he's paying or she's paying in debt. Where is that information coming from? Very fact that he has it. Yeah. Well, let's go back in a little, little bit here. It turns out several things that you can do. First thing you do, of course, is check whether you've actually borrowed from Tala before. So you've actually borrowed from Tala before and you've paid back the money you're a good credit risk, do you get the loan right away? Suppose you have never paid back your money. This is the first time you borrowed from Tala. Then what does Tala look for? Well, it has access to your contacts. It goes on your list of contacts and checks every list, every person on your list. And then says any of them borrowed from Tala before, have they paid back the money? If they have, the idea is that's good for you because people tend to hang out with other people who are like them. If your friends are dead beats, you're not going to, you're going to likely to be a deadbeat too, and you're not getting a loan. None of your friends have repaid the money, you're not going to get any money. Okay. But suppose none of your friends have borrowed from Tala. What else? It doesn't know who these people are, right? Who are the other people around you? It, 
Kala doesn't know that. It's sitting somewhere in Nairobi. You're in some village somewhere in the, in the distant, you know, savannah. But what it also does then is for additional things. Turns out if your phone calls last for more than four minutes, you tend to have stronger relationships. You can check the length of time you're talking on your phone. If you communicate with more than 58 different contacts, you're a better borrower because you're a wide network to depend on. If more than 40% of the entries in your contact list are both first and last names, that's much better. It's a 16 times more reliable than very few customers with both first and last names. So for example, if I just have Shawnee as one of my list, tough luck, right? Because I'm not very obviously, I'm not consensuous. And better than having Shawnee first is with capital S and capital U and the rest are small. If they're all small, that's not good because I'm not taking the time to be <coughs> consensuous enough about typing in capital S, H, A, small H, A, L, I, and I. I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't. That's true. Maybe they can't, but then the point is that they won't get a loan either. Right? The question again is that these are all things, but it goes beyond that. Let's suppose this is just one of the things. The other thing that phone also knows is your location. It doesn't know where you work, but what it does know is every, literally every two minutes or so, your phone is checking for a signal from the local cell phone tower. And it's recording on your phone where you are, literally every two minutes. So all Thala does is check between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. Is your phone in the same place every day? Between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Is your phone in the same place every day? How does Thala get access to that data? He asks you. When, you. when you apply for a loan from Thala, it says if you want that app, would you have permissions to do all this? How many of us read those permissions? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's okay, right? No, no, my point is the, uh, how long they have been on phone yeah. and all of that data is only with the mobile uh, service phone. Right, point is, the, it's all on your phone already. Correct. So when you install an app, how many apps, when the that. first thing the app asks is, can we have permissions to access this, this, this? How many of us read that and say, no, I'm not going to get permission to this app? Very few. Right? Some, some of us do, but most of us just hit OK and forget about it. That's where you're getting that info from. And of course, if you don't give permission for Tala to read those, it's not going to give you a loan anyway. So you might as well do it. So coming back to that, and again, another another thing it does is looks at your location of your phone. If your phone hasn't moved from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m., and again, does go in a different place, but from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. is in the same place. You have a home and a job, right? If you were homeless, your phone would be in a different place every night. I can tell you that by just tracking your phone over time. It's a very nice article in the New York Times. I believe yesterday which detailed just how much information which is available in a little map about people who know literally to the extent of phones the phone going into a school and you can see the kid playing in the school that extent of information they have okay this is it so you can check um, that okay the kid was in play on the swings between 3 p.m. and 3 30 p.m. if you if that's the time when the kid is supposed to be in class the app will be tracking that kid as well so it's the amount of data we give up about ourselves is unbelievable. All right, another thing also is very careful. So for example, because they have access to your information already, when you need to pay back the loan, it doesn't keep sending you emails when there's no money in your account. What's the point? You're not going to pay it back. So what the first thing it does is if you buy something with a phone or you, if you're, remember you're a shopkeeper or something like that. So if somebody pays you with a mobile phone, the money hits your account, immediately Tala sends you an SMS. By the way, you remember you owe us money. So it turns out that more than 80% of people pay right away the moment they get that reminder. So a very, very good uh, system of trying to take advantage of the sheer amount of data we give up of ourselves. The problem, of course, is this doesn't really control. This is all on an individual basis. Uh, that means, in other words, it's about your behavior and your characteristics. But it's very difficult to figure out how people behave in groups, right? And that's no one has cracked this problem yet. So slime mold, for example, looks like a fungus. It turns out every now and then, when the concentration of pheromones in that fungus gets above a certain level, the pieces of that fungus split up and travel away to different parts of the jungle. So this is actually millions 
of tiny little organisms, each of which can survive by itself. And every now and then, they come together into a giant mass. And, but there's no brain there. It's just being done with behavior everywhere else around you. The same thing with ants. Then you know, again, there's no queen ant which is basically deciding what has to be done within the, uh, within the nest. The ants base their activity on the basis of pheromones that each of them is releasing as they move around. Right? So if you meet another, for example, there's sometimes battles between two ant nests. Right? How do those battles form? There's no general saying, I want to go and attack that nest. I'm sorry? Uh, what Sleep. Which is meant as a group. Yes, okay. Simply the group. Okay. Yeah. In this particular case, though, it's not that. Right? In this particular case, what happens is every time an ant is walking somewhere, it's laying a scent trail behind them. If you find another scent trail from, a, from an ant from a different colony, two scent trails are colliding. As long as their level of scent is below a level, they won't fight because there's enough food. But the scent trails cross each other faster and faster. Each ant feels that, okay, there's not enough food. I'm smelling the other ants too frequently, which means that they start fighting with each other. There's no brain there which is co coordinating to say, we've got to attack the other ant. It happens spontaneously. And unfortunately, a lot of human behavior is also like that. We tend to do things because of our environment. And it, there has been no, pretty much no computer system in the world which has figured out how we track that. Right? There's some ele elements, like your friends are not paying back the loans, you're not going to pay back the loans, but again, it's kind of like a messy egg. So where are we? So for markets, what we're saying is improvements in data ontology, improvements in the way of classifying stuff, is allowing us to get lots of data from huge streams of data and categorize it across many dimensions. Advances matching algorithms help us find and select what is the partner we want. And finally, machine learning systems identify those preferences so that we don't have to time uh, spend time <coughs> making those preferences explicit. Okay, so that's the first part here. So that leads directly into the area of automation. So automation, what kind of industries can be replaced with automation? The first thing is, remember, we need to figure out data. We need that data and we need the characterized data on which to train systems which will make those decisions for us. So the data if, it's, if you have lots of data, that can be easily automated. Example, if you think about people writing, writing life insurance policies, the data on which you base your life insurance policy is pretty much standard. So you have a very few types of policy. It is based on your age, it's based on your health condition, it's based on a bunch of other things, but those are characterized, right? And there are large data sets, and eventually you know what's gonna happen. The person's gonna fall ill, the person's gonna die, you have to pay out. So you have both the things. So that's an area where you can easily replace human beings with computers. Because the data set to train a computer to act, act accordingly is very straightforward. Actually, that's another example of an area which can be easily automated. With executives on the other hand, you have a big set of decisions you make. It's not just one or two decisions you make repetitively. So that means it's much more difficult to automate a high-level executive than it is to automate uh, Clark's functions. Right. So that means if you think about uh, if you think about the types of organization, accounting is much more likely to be automated. When they have that business development, almost unlikely that it will be automated over here because you you have to react constantly to what the other person is saying in an area like business development. Taxes big chance of it can be completely automated. Revenue management, cash disbursement, none of these things actually require humans. These things do, external relations, audit, risk management, financial planning and analysis, these are the stuff which is less likely to be automated. So the ideal executive today would be something like a T-shaped skill set. That's basically, I have knowledge in a particular area, but I can also apply that knowledge across a bunch of different areas. That's much better than having deep information in one area because the moment you have deep information in one area, it is also a deep data set. That information can then be automated. Right? The stuff going across areas, there's not enough data. So your job is likely to be much safer. So the good news is, as top level decision makers, we may still be replaceable. 
until, of course, on machine learning systems are trained with lots of different types of data, and then eventually they replace us as well. But that's hopefully in the future not going to happen. Next topic, AI. So we talk a lot about AI and machine learning. Will that replace human beings? So the starting point is how does AI systems work? That is basically, again, I've been talking a lot about those training data sets. So let's apply it to something which is straightforward, which is understanding a picture of a cat. Can I identify this cat as a cat? Okay. So what I do is I start with a bunch of digital images like cats, dogs, beaches, mountains, or whatever, and descriptions, basically the same thing, the labeling, the data. Then I train that data, I train a computer to learn how to predict labels for a new set of digital images. That's my goal. That's what I want to do. So, and you can do this by going to a website like cloud.google.com, and you can download literally hundreds of data sets which you can use to train your own system. That's the classical approach. So the classical approach is you create a set of rules that identify the color, the brightness, the edges, and so on and so forth, and then say, okay, based on that, that's likely to be a cat. It doesn't work. Yes, that's the problem. It's very difficult to tell if a cat is taking a different position from the previous cat. Is it still a cat? The computer doesn't know this. Human beings can, but the computer won't. So this approach doesn't really work very well. I'm sorry. to go, but still, uh, Google or any of these things have reached quite a few seconds. It, is, it has an initial levels of success, but I'm still going to classify this as a second order threat, not a primary threat right now. It's too far away. Far away, yes, but the question is that how far? Maybe within the next couple of years it will be there as more and more people. It's if you have a years Google old. Lens, if you see, it's already introduced, right? So you take it and then you sell. So it's already collecting all that humongous data every day. What I'm going to argue is that this will be 20 years away. And I'll give you that same answer five years from now. <laughs> For it's example, when it comes away. to, let's say, the images, right? Sorry? Images, photographs that you have taken, the way it classifies, it identifies your people. At least let, let me give you some examples. We'll see what the problems actually are. So hold off on that for a minute. Okay. So this is the big one, right? This is limited success. The modern one is something called a layered neural network. But the, the neural network works like this. At the end of the day, you have to identify something as a wolf or a dog. Right? You've got a picture of a wolf, you've got a picture of a dog over there, and you want to bring it down and say 90% probability this is definitely a dog. How do you do it? So it's called a Layered neural network because there are multiple layers and each layer does something else. So layer number one looks at the edges and only at the edges. So it says, okay, these are all the edges. The second layer puts some of the edges together to say, okay, that looks like a nose. And the top layer puts the, all the pieces together to get the final one and it comes out to the top. Right? So that's a each one is a layered network. And that's happening because the cost of computing has gone down dramatically. So you can, for example, again, download the Stanford dog data set, which has 20,000 images of 120 different breeds of dogs. And you have lots of algorithms which you can use, lots of different types of hardware which is available. OK, but deep learning. Deep learning is a sort of variant of this. So the approach here is actually pretty straightforward. There are four, four or five different approaches. But let me give you some examples to start with coming in to say why this is so let's take that example I used before about Google finishing your sentences. When you're typing in Gmail, Google completes your sentence. How does Gmail do this? So the idea is pretty straightforward. On a neural network, it basically takes a source text and puts every pair of words together. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. The training sample would be the quick and the brown. These are close to the. Here, quick, the, brown are close to each other. Right? And so on and so forth. So it keeps word after word after word. Sentence after sentence being typed into Gmail is being uploaded to the Gmail server. So Gmail knows everything any of us type in any of our email programs. Okay, now a new word comes in. Let's say you're typing the word Soviet. The training data set has lots of examples of Soviet and Union together, but a very few examples of Soviet and Sasquatch together. <coughs> 
So when you type in Soviet, it's going to guess you did Soviet Union because there's so many examples of Soviet Union, they drown out any other the other examples you will see. Right? It almost appears uncanny, but that's the way because it's collecting information from everywhere in the world. Anyone typing emails is giving information to Google at that time. Now, why is this a problem? The problem is, let's take the precise thing they call, it's called recurrent neural networks. That's the strategy that Google uses, and it works like this. That is, you have to keep track of every line in the sentence in order to figure out its meaning, to guess the last word. So here's an example. The clouds are in the, what do you predict is the next word? Sky. And it's not difficult at all. Okay? Now let me give you a different sentence. Here, the reason you know, Google would predict, Google doesn't find it difficult. Why? Because it has to go back only four letters to find the word clouds and knows that lots of examples of cloud and sky being next to each other. Make sense? Okay, let's give me take a different sentence. I grew up in France in a little village south of the river Seine. My, father, my parents had a small summer house there. I spent a lot of time work, playing with my grandmother on the banks of the street. I speak fluent, and that's obvious for us because we are coming up with a narration. But for the computer say French, it has to go all the way back to the beginning maybe a paragraph ago, maybe 10 paragraphs ago, maybe a couple of pages ago. This is really, really difficult for a computer to do because the computer doesn't understand the meaning of the sentence. For us, we are already converting this into a narrative. We are converting it into a story. So even if there are like 20 more lines after that, we'll be able to guess French. Immediately, the computer will not be able to do that. That's very tough to do. That's one problem. Right? So, but it creates another problem. Let's see, can you spot the difference between this and this? Most of us, you know, this is kind of a blurred one, so you can't see it, but I'll give you what it is. It's this picture right here. And if you look at that picture, what is that? Right there in the corner. That's actually a picture of an elephant. Right? The, the reason this was, the title of the uh, article was The Elephant in the Room. Okay, now what is going on here? When Google or any of these uh, artificial intelligence programs tries to analyze this, they look at every item in the room and break it up into shapes. And they give it a probability based on those layered networks I was talking about. They look at the shapes and they say, okay, here there is a cup. There's a 54% probability that this is a cup. Here's a couch. At 58% probability, there's a couch. There's a person. There's a TV and so on and so forth. But the problem with the network is it doesn't know what's important and what's not important. So coming back in here, in the first case, or on the left hand side here, they said there's an 81% probability this is a chair. You add the elephant to the room, it reevaluates re the probability of everything in the room. So what happens here is now a 57% probability this is not a chair anymore. It become a couch. The cup in the room, which was over here, has disappeared. It no longer identifies the cup, right? They, over here, there was a handbag. The handbag was a 67% probability. It drops to a 30% probability. Basically, what you think about, is this interesting? Well, it may be interesting when you say, okay, yeah, this is kind of fanciful, but think about yourself driving an autonomous car. So the autonomous car sees a turkey running past you on the side of the road, Immediately reevaluate the probability you've got a pedestrian right in front of you and it's a pedestrian. It's not a pedestrian anymore, it's a piece of paper. You don't want something like that under your control, right? That's that's it's a, that's something which is extremely dangerous. But it's very difficult to do this. So for example, these are images which consistently fool machine learning systems. It says here there's a panda with 57% confidence. You overlay it with noise that looks like this. For a human being, what does this look like? Pretty much the same thing. We are not fooled by this. The computer will not call this a given with 99% confidence. Or this one here. This is an image from the data set. They add some noise to it. This is a clean image. This is a little bit of noise. That's a lot of noise. For us though, they're pretty much the same because you're automatically adjusting for the fact that we know what we're supposed to be seeing. In the first case though, in the clean image, this says this is a washer with 54% probability. This one says it's a safe with 34% probability and a washer with only 22% probability. 
This one here says it's a safe with 37% probability and a loudspeaker with 24% probability. It's the same thing. But as you can see, this is an entire area of uh, machine learning called adversarial uh, machine learning. The people try to generate images whose only purpose is to fool artificial intelligence systems. So adversarial AI. So this basically makes us see that there are lots of problems which are happening. For example, Microsoft introduced a chatbot called Hey. Hey was a chatbot which was supposed to interact with people in the general public and figure out how to talk. Unfortunately, users found out that basically, how does Hey learn how to speak? Learns how to speak from other people. What is the appropriate thing to say? You know, determines based on interactions with humans. So immediately, they started bombarding K with racist tweets. So within a day or two, K was talking about, oh, Hitler, he's the greatest person on earth. I love Hitler. Or he would say, I, the Holocaust never happened. Trump, amazing, he's the best president ever. So within, within two days, Microsoft had to take it down because basically the computer learned without realizing what's, that it was being given this whole host of sentences we could assume was the right sentence because you know people have been giving it those sentences. So you could deliberately take that. Another example, Facebook. Facebook also organized chatbots whose only purpose was to make it easier for you to live without ever leaving Facebook. So you could ask the chatbot to say, buy this stuff on Amazon from me. No, for, for me. So go to Amazon, buy me a uh, buy me a, a pair of headphones and have it shipped to my house. So Facebook chatbot will do it automatically. So, unfortunately, it created a chatbot to barter with another chatbot. This would check how it worked. It turned out the chatbot found it very difficult to negotiate in English because nobody, you know, English is very uh, inefficient language. So it started using its own language. Instead of saying, I don't care about the books, I just want the balls, the chatbot would say, balls are zero to me, to me, to me. Basically, that emphasizes how important the value of that ball is to this thing. So this is, it never was taught how to do this. We just figured out that it's the fastest way to get it way possible. Another example, these are, these are examples where artificial intelligence systems go wrong. There's another example which is the exact opposite. Target spent a lot of its time trying to figure out when women became pregnant. Why? It's because most of us never change our habits. When we go into, how many people how many of us go into different grocery stores every week? We don't, right? We know our grocery store, we know what we like. We just walk into the grocery store, close our eyes, we pull out the milk, close our eyes, grab the chips or whatever. At this point, they're experimenting with something. So target an enormous amount of data analysis to try to figure this out. And the story goes that one day, this woman, this guy, big hefty guy comes into the target the office and basically demands to see the manager. The manager says, yes, how can I help you? And the guy says, what the hell are you guys doing? My daughter is 16 years old. You sent her materials to her what black people look like. They think they're gorillas. Right? This actually did happen. So when Google were tagging pictures, it would look at black people and call them gorillas. So why did that happen? It turns out that if you work at Google, you're typically not black. You're either Asian, you're that means Chinese, you're Indian, or you are white. Those are the data set they have. The entire training data set had very few black people. So when they had pictures uploaded to Google Photos, they were tagged as gorillas. So how did Google solve that problem? It didn't. You can't search for gorillas now. You put a black commercial, you put a gorilla in there, Google will not recognize it. It just took it out of its database. It doesn't exist. Okay? So let's stop around here. The last item is about blockchain that I'm going to uh, probably too much to talk, or talk about here. So let's stop up about here, and if you have any questions, we're happy to take it for five minutes. I have a question. <coughs> uh, Dr. Rao, could you tell us a little about fake news? A lot of uh, you know efforts are being put in to stop fake news. Uh, I, I, I thought you would be commenting on that. Uh, first of all, technology is it going to help. So, could you throw some light on that? Thank you. Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, uh, the more I re the more about information I have about how much technology can already figure out everything about us, 
the less technologically literate I'm becoming. So I don't have Facebook, I don't have Twitter, I don't have Instagram, I don't have pretty much any social media I try to avoid. I keep my phone on airline mode almost all the time, except when I need to make a phone call. Which is actually uh, not, sometimes my wife does not like that for some reason. So technology is not an unadulterated blessing in, in what I'm trying to say here. And uh, the worst case scenario is actually in China, where it turns out in China, um, you are rated by the quality of the information you give. And it's not just information about what, um, you know, uh, what job you do or your everything else, but it's anything. If you spend 10 hours a day playing video games, the computer marks you down. The social credit system marks you down. You find yourself unable to get a loan to find you're playing video games. If your friend criticizes the government, your rating gets marked down. So that's an example of use technology actually being used really on the dark side around us. Right? So anyway, it's but a sad one. I'm sorry? Uh, well, if you're talking about the fact that all of us have an Aadhaar card right now and you know, that you pay 670 rupees, I can get access to biometric information of any person I want in the country, that also leaves me a little scared because I can't change my biometric information. Right? And I can use now, I can, if I can falsify your Aadhaar card, I can open a bank account in your name, I can open a credit account in your name. It's kind of tough to worry about that, right? Nobody actually checks that. It's scary. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy about the advances you made, but I'm also, I'm also worried about just how fast these things are going. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get the um, what I was trying to say is fake news. Uh, did I sound like Facebook? I don't know. Ah, well, it turns out it's becoming even more difficult to defend against fake news. Right now, I can take your picture, I can take your images, and make you say anything you want to say on YouTube. So. And people, in the old days, the only way I could actually detect that was to count, the, the way was to check the amount of time you blinked, right? The reason is actually very simple, because all the pictures uploaded on YouTube and all that stuff, if you take photographs, there are lots of photographs of people with their eyes open, but there are very few photographs of people with their eyes closed, right? Because most of us would delete those pictures right away. We don't upload those. So if you see somebody on a fake news video and they keep their eyes open too long, that's not a human being, most likely, but they're finding ways around it. It's, they're generating images of people blinking naturally. So what I say right now, two years from now, you, you will be completely unable to detect a fake news event from a real news event. Okay. Right? Fake WhatsApp is trying something, so you cannot, for example, send a WhatsApp message to more than five people in India right now. Right? Maybe those kind of things are basically things like adding friction, making it less difficult, making it more difficult to do things through technology. That's what maybe we need, not make it too easy to do things through technology. What is Hold on, let, let me get to uh, Thank you for the wonderful session. Uh, it was very useful. Uh, I just want to know, like, uh, as technology and the disruption of finance that we are talking about, are we really going towards uh, technology and disruption of uh, science? Because uh, we feel that applied and pure science could disappear as the way technology grows. And as even as an example for you, uh, uh, degree from chemistry and then you turn out to be a, a different professional. So is this going to be uh, alarming uh, for the uh, uh, next generation that science is going to disappear one day? At not the moment. I don't believe so for a simple reason. The way you train these kind of systems right now, the artificial intelligence of the system, remember, is about the fact of taking the training database of things you're seeing already. So that means if these, at the moment, artificial intelligence and other systems are unable to innovate. So there's still a role for both pure and applied sciences because it involves putting things together in ways that other people have not done before. And if other people have not done before, the computers cannot take that at the moment to develop a new insight. You can just progress along the same line, but it can't take any leaps of innovation. So human beings are still in the picture. But who knows how long? Hold on a second. Let everybody hear on that.
mine was more of a request than uh, a question. I just wanted to get your views on the blockchain that you were going to talk about okay. uh, very quickly. So blockchains is basically very straightforward. Yeah, it's a, there's a lot of hype about it now. Like you read about it in the papers every day. Um, this company introduces blockchains, that company introduces Basically all it is is ledger entries, like in a bank ledger, but chained into a block so that no entry can be altered without the previous entry also having to be altered. So that's why it's a chain of ledger entries. You need a blockchain under only three circumstances, right? One is you want to have anonymity. That means you don't want anyone to see who is able to read or write the data. That's, so in other words, if I want to do a transaction, I don't want you to know that I'm doing the transaction with him. That's one possibility. The second one is you do not want the transaction to be altered. So the way you do it is, if either of us try to alter the transaction, it's immediately visible to everybody else in the, in the entire system. And the third thing you want is unstructured data. Remember the relational databases we talked about had fields which are going in particular areas. This is any length of data you want. And the beauty of something called the hashing method is, regardless of whether you're looking at something the length of war and peace, or you're looking at something the length of a nursery rhyme, they have the same hash length. It's like a pointer that points to the original data. If you change the original data, even add one full stop, one comma to it, it will change the hash completely. Right? So those things are the ideal bits about the blockchain. So what that means is, for example, uh, let's suppose you want to run a company which where you don't know who your customers or where you don't know who your employees are. I was talking about this earlier. There's a company called Mythal Wimble. And it turns out that all their coders, their, their programmers, they use Harry Potter usernames. So my name would be Harry Potter on that, somebody else would be Dumbledore, somebody else. You don't know who these real people are. But what does it matter? They're all doing their job, you're paying them in an electronic currency like Bitcoin or Ether or whatever. Which country are you located in? Which country knows that you are, um, you know, you're a resident of that country and therefore you need to pay taxes in this country? How do you associate that kind of organization? These are the new things that are happening today, right? Assets. Do I actually need to own anything when I can just show my ownership um, and transfer ownership seamlessly? The ideal example I did like to use is, imagine you go to the bathroom at 3 o'clock in the morning. So all your light bulbs at home are connected to the internet. You turn on the light bulb at that precise minute when you Instinct when you turn it on, the light bulb checks with all the local electricity companies to say who's going to supply me with electricity at the cheapest price right now. It writes a contract with that electric company, gets the electricity while you're in the bathroom. The moment you turn off the light, the contract is over, the money is transferred from one to the other. What the blockchain has done is to reduce the length of a typical electricity contract from one year to three minutes. Okay. And it has reduced the price for that contract from say 500 rupees to 1,000th of a rupee. You can never get that in real life, but you can do that with a blockchain. That means your transaction sizes are tiny and the amounts of money transacted are really, really small. Okay. Sorry? Yeah, you don't need to. Right? So, like Sweden for example, or China. If you go to China today, you cannot transact with cash. If you see a beggar on the road, you would look at his QR code on his phone and you text him money. If you will not take <laughs> cash, nobody takes cash. Sweden, the same thing. You go to a restaurant and you offer cash, they say, we can't do anything with it. Just, don't you have something to pay with? They won't, they won't take cash. So, it's happening uh, in a lot of places. Right? But again, you don't need cash which is issued by the government. You can have cash like Bitcoin or Ether which is issued by private parties. That's fine too. So, uh, as your like, uh, personal opinion, cryptocurrency is legal or illegal as a financial? I'm sorry? Cryptocurrency, yeah. using cryptocurrency is legal or illegal? Well, the cryptocurrencies at the moment was started the proof of concept, right? When Satoshi Nakamoto invented the first um, idea for a Bitcoin, he didn't really mean it to be used like a cryptocurrency. It was just a proof of concept. That means that because of the intrinsic technological limitations, you cannot get, uh, you can't transact with the same speed as with Visa. When you buy something in a restaurant, you stick it into the machine, have your code in, it takes less than one second before that transaction is approved. 
If you do this with a Bitcoin, it could take you 28 minutes before your transaction is approved because it has to be mined somewhere. That's the number of transactions being done. Right? So I don't think cryptocurrencies are as useful because of time factor than blockchains. Because blockchains are things which are contracts and you can they have to stay in existence. So the people who are won't need to be worried are lawyers. Right? Because you're replacing lawyers with computers. Is it true that uh, the enrollment for the legal uh, courses in the U.S. has fallen down? I'm sorry? Uh, the enrollment for legal profession, for uh, lawyers, yes. uh, because well, uh, they predict that the future lawyers will be computer based. Part of, part of it, but I don't think it's being driven by cryptocurrencies or, uh, or blockchains. I think that's mainly being driven by the fact that there are too many lawyers on the market right now, that, that's, uh, and they're not all getting jobs. And so it's not yet, but in a few years, I'm probably going to see that uh, you know a lot of companies are replacing lawyers with with smart contracts. Okay. Uh, so we spoke about uh, this uh, blockchain's advantages, but are there any disadvantages or drawbacks? Uh, what? Uh, sorry. The drawbacks of the blockchain, or is there anything uh, drawbacks or disadvantages to it? But disadvantages of blockchain. Yeah. We just spoke about it's the just advantages. Like technology. It is like saying, I consider blockchain to be the equivalent of, say, double entry bookkeeping. Right? So, double entry bookkeeping is just a tool. So, it's either um, you use it to organize the information you have, you don't use it, you don't ever organize the information you have. There is, it's nothing really intrinsically good or bad about it. Like, you can do whatever you want. You can do it with a, you can do it with a central database. But the problem with the central database is, person who owns the database can change the data on the database. Right? So if you store your money, if you store all your transactions on um, on the cloud, whoever owns it, Amazon or Google or whatever, can deny you uh, can deny you access to your information which is stored on the cloud at any time. Nobody can deny you information on the blockchain. So it's a decentralized ledger. That's the idea. There's nothing there's nothing about drawbacks or whatever. It's like you use the tool or you don't use Lots of in, in it's not it. It's, it's that I would probably say if you have to choose between these three types of things, automation is going on right now. Uh, blockchain starting to be used by companies, but not as much as automation. And AI probably the least developed of them. Okay. Well, thank you very much.